water than something that I always have. It can be a hurdle in my life sometimes, but I always have it. I've always known my life to be with it. Wouldn't know any different. I always try not to let it stop me in my life. I want to always defeat the stereotype. I don't want to be put in a box. I just always want to help people remain positive where I can and just repay the support and sacrifices my mum's always made for me. She's always been there for me. First of all, I was absolutely terrified because they mentioned the word autism and not knowing anything about Asperger's, it really frightened the life out of me, to be quite honest. Like it's all lumped together under the, the umbrella of autistic you know, sy syndrome. It just, yeah, frightened me. Dad totally denied there was anything wrong um, because there were no outward signs. You know, nobody understood what Asperger's was and they weren't prepared to actually find out about it. So it was really an uphill battle to get the family to accept it. So I want to make this documentary for a few reasons. The first is to further understand myself about the disability, to learn about the factors, about why it isn't just a one size fits all disability. Second is because I wanted to show that just because you have a disability, you don't have to be limited and that you can achieve your goals in life. And finally, I wanted to help educate the wider community about the disability, as although it's common that it's not really portrayed widely in the media. I have been treated differently. Um, I think especially Actually, since I think in media portrayals as well it's kind of you know always surrounded by men um, at least I haven't really seen many portrayals that you know are um, are women um, but I think obviously you have that very stereotypical portrayal of autism and then I think that's kind of what people kind of expect it to be like especially with um, you know the diagnosis process I think it's very catered to boys and um, you know, there's a higher, um, it's like the ratio, I think, of diagnosis is like one to five with boys and girls. Um, so I think it's kind of like, oh, but you're a girl, you can't be autistic. Please could you briefly explain your research into people with autism and their vulnerabilities throughout life? Uh, yes, so we have at the Autism Research Centre, we have, uh, so, so, so let me sort of briefly explain the Autism Research Centre. So we do a whole range of research tied to autism so all the way from genetics you know which is what uh, i primarily work in all the way to policy the general population are uh, you know there's a normal distribution so we all carry varying level of genetic variants that that predispose us to an autism diagnosis likelihood higher genetic likelihood to be autistic was linked to sadly to sort of experiencing vulnerabilities during childhood the moments when you really struggled when i was growing up yeah, especially when you weren't hitting your milestones, you know, because that was the time that I thought there was something seriously wrong with you and didn't understand. And it was frustrating. The most common ones like um, lack of eye content, contact, um, difficulty with, with looking directly at people, um, some certain amounts of hand and eye coordination, um, and particularly noticeable at times like after PE when you was getting dressed and particularly with things like buttons, fine motor skills a little. Um, confidence when there was a new situation or when something suddenly changed from what the routine had been up to that point. And also the fact that 
um, when children start school and start to play with other children, they go through several stages. Initially, they sort of play individually, then they play alongside, and then they play interactively. I was diagnosed with autism when I was three years old. Um, so yeah, it's it's been <laughs> it's been quite a while since uh, the whole uh, diagnosis process. I don't really remember much of it <laughs> at all. Um, but yeah, that was really interesting to get diagnosed so young, uh, especially as a female. No, thank you. I remember that as being, I was diagnosed when I was two, so I don't really remember my initial thoughts with Yeah. <laughs> quite a long time. We never treated you any differently. We just, you, you were you as you were. If anything, I think the fact that when you were diagnosed, which was down to your mum, which really pushed, is your dyspraxia was more more of highlighted than anything because you've always just been James. We've never we've never treated you any differently. I suppose it made me sit back and think more because, as I say, because sometimes when you're so close to something, you don't see it, even though like I did work with children. I think in many respects you were particularly fortunate. Number one, because your mother had already realised the difficulties um, and if you like you came to school with a diagnosis, with, with a, a background knowledge of what the problem was, plus the fact that in 1994 for the first time the code of practice for special educational needs was introduced by the government which brought to bear a certain um, prescription on us to provide different elements, including um, individual education plans, working together with outside agencies, and there was more support coming from the local edu education authorities. So in a, in a respect, you came in at the right time. It's not an easy dimension to have to deal with from the parent point of view. It's a difficult time though. Um, I'd probably just say school. I don't know, school was just really hard. It's just not catered to, um, you know, autistic people, disabled people in general, uh, very neurotypical based. Um, and not even just within yourself, but with other people, like, you know, school kids are mean, <laughs> you know, um, like any anything like slightly different about you, they're gonna pick on you for it. Um, and teachers don't understand, no one understands, like, this is just your brain. It's like different to everyone else's, even on the spectrum. So um, I think that was quite difficult, but um, yeah, now I don't know, I just look back on it and I'm like, not like grateful, but it has been um, an experience. <laughs> I know it's normal, not everybody's gonna like you want to be your friend, especially hard at secondary school. But when I went to college, the friendship did out change and people became more mature and started slowly to accept me for who I was. I think the first time I went to uni was when people properly started to accept me. Although initially I was introverted, over time my confidence grew and I started to talk to more people, make more friends. So I've always had an open house, so um, when other kids come down, I try to encourage you to come and, and Thomas and join in with other kids, but not force you, because obviously like in my, you knew my house, you knew my garden, um, you knew a lot of the kids around but to try to encourage you to interact more with other kids. Silly things like not playing with other children. You were a very insular child and that was quite hard because you expected a lot of attention all the time. Uh, do you think that my autism had an impact on my school life at all? I think inevitably it must have impacted on your school life, particularly in respect of the social issues, the, the social misunderstandings at times, um, and also little things like perhaps when you were talking, um, not always realising maybe when other children had turned off or moved on to something else. Um, things like um, having we were very aware that we needed to teach you aspects of, of body language and what it meant. I think as an autistic person it's quite hard to like socialise and you know just social skills in general but um, I think they're like a pretty good leeway into just you know just talking about these games that you love with people just playing together and um, yeah I kind of owe a lot of my friendships to video games. The older I developed coping strategies and realised that everybody didn't want to be friends with me. 
I was, avoided school trips where I had to stay away because I was nervous. But I was successful academically, which led me to study my GCSEs and my A levels. I'd say some of autism, they're very like, they're always there for you, you know, they, they stick to the plans, uh, caring, the loving, and I think in a way you, you feel more like welcomed by them because obviously I've opened up to you a lot and stuff like that and it's taken me a while to do that to my other friends just certainly because I feel like you're not a judgmental person whatsoever. During the coronavirus pandemic I've had a shift in friendships. It's been hard to get to know people at UD because we can't go out and socialise and it's difficult to get to know someone digitally. I was so proud when I went to university. I knew from a young age I always wanted to go. I didn't do very well in my A-levels. But luckily, due to a one-to-one -one meeting with my lecturer, I was offered a place on the Broadcasting, Journalism and Media Communications degree. University was a time of firsts. It was the first time living away from home, as it was 200 miles away. I loved the course side of uni. I enjoyed learning the subjects and being given the freedom to choose what I wanted to write about. This leads me to the proudest moment of my life, my graduation. I never thought in my wildest dreams it would come true. Or I'd get a 2-1. I was so happy. When graduation day finally came, it was a magical event, from getting dressed in the mortarboard and gown to walking across the stage and hearing my name read out. There's no feeling like it. I'm 28 and I have Autism Spectrum Disorder and Spaxia, which I'll live with for the rest of my life. I don't do these things to escape my condition, I do them because I enjoy them. Unfortunately, due to the coronavirus pandemic, I haven't been able to go out and do the things I enjoy. This has meant my not confidence has been knocked and that's because I've been staying at home. Through my own research and what I have learned over the years, hobbies and interests play a big part in someone with autism. People with disability are more likely to have one or more hobbies or special interests that they keep for a long time. My special interests include going to comic cons and the West End for the experience and escapism. I also enjoy writing my own fantasy and science fiction stories which I have done for many years. After I graduated from Glyndor, I had a rough idea of what I wanted to do as a career. I wanted to work in the TV industry, but it was a catch-22 situation. You need experience to get a job, and a job to get experience. I was really upset I couldn't go into my dream industry. I started at an apprenticeship in my local council in 2018. I really enjoyed it and learnt so much and it really helped improve my confidence. Initially when I first started, did you notice any differences between me and other members of the team in regards to like the way I worked or uh, what tasks I were better suited to. I thought that you settled in quickly. You had a good rapport with, with myself and with other members of the team quite quickly. Um, I suppose it, it it probably helped with hindsight that the fact that we we had you sat next to me and then we had people like the other, other colleagues sat nearby that you got on well with, um, and that you know that that seemed to work out well. But uh, in terms of the work that you did, it, you, not really. No, I mean I, I, as of said to you at other times, you know, I thought you were an extremely enthusiastic and hardworking. You were particularly strong when you were given fairly detailed IT related tasks to do. So, and as you know, we spent a lot of time working on SharePoint sites together <laughs> and, and you were a massive help to me by picking up a lot of the load on designing and setting up SharePoint sites for, for various projects. And that, that, was, that was work that required quite a lot of detail and, and, and a lot of persistence really as well and, and you were very good at doing that without complaint cheerfully to a very good standard. However due to the events of 2020 my life took a direction I didn't think it would. At the time of filming this documentary I've been studying my master's degree in television production. I moved back home in December because of the coronavirus pandemic and I've applied for several graduate schemes. I've also got a work experience at production company in August and I'm hoping to graduate with at least a 2-1. I just, you know, when you're 
playing this field until I tell them. <laughs> I'll go, oh, I know that boy. <laughs> Most recently, I'd say probably, I think for me personally, when I notice a turning point, and not just autism, but all disabilities being betrayed more in a positive light, is probably the 2012 Paralympics. I think that's when uh, yes. the world stage, and I know there were Paralympics before, but it was just something about the London ones that were just changing, especially with the launch of shows like The Last Reg. What would your advice be to any colleagues who are working in the education sector with pupils with autism? Well, I think, I think for one thing, you're absolutely right about just to go back on one thing, the positive image. I think that's something that's definitely changed. Um, it's changed because of the media um, intervention, but it's also changed because I think everybody realised that that was going to be so necessary to promote the positivity of this situation so that people who had got difficulties in any area realised that their difficulties could actually also have a very positive outcome and that they got qualities that other people didn't have and when you start realising that it does doesn't definitely um, bring you up to that conclusion about it like that really it's a great asset to a school it's a strength to be built on not to be hidden away so do you have any advice for parents of students with autism who might be concerned about their children in school well, you could probably guess what my first piece of advice is. Please, please, please go into the school and discuss your concerns. The difference that teamwork makes, it made it to you. And it without any doubt, when sometimes that wasn't there, not with your parents, but, but certainly, I mean, your mother was, was amazing. But I won't pretend that it was there with every, every student we had. Um, and you could certainly see the difference that that made. Therefore, that is, if anything, the most important thing that from a, from a school's point of view, um, you can advise parents to do. Come in, be part of the team, be willing to listen and be willing to discuss and actually share strategies because things that maybe are done at home, we can benefit from in school. Um, and also to be part of meetings at times when we have outside agency meetings. So that instead of being shut off from it, they're there to be part of it. And I think um, if parents are willing to do that, to be part of it, it makes a very, very crucial difference. And I think certainly in your case, it's made a very big difference to how successful, how delightfully successful your life has been since. Uh, did you have a moment of realisation that either everything will be okay or knew that I was going to be able to survive independently? I think when you went to university, that's, that's when it suddenly hit me that yes, you're going to be fine. If you manage well on your own, you coped. Um, you had your struggles, but you still coped and you did really, really well. Living on your own for anyone is hard, but living on your own with a, you know, something like Asperger's is ten times harder than anyone else. I think you're brilliant, what you've done, what you've achieved, you know, compared to this solitary little lad all on his own that wouldn't play with anyone. You know, you've gone out in the big wide world, you've got a degree, and you, you know, hopefully get your masters. Um, yeah, you'll be flying. Yeah, I'm really proud of you. And as a mother, what's the best advice you could give to any parent whose child has Asperger's syndrome? I would say, First of all, read as much as you can. You know your own child. Um, if you've got any inclination that anything is wrong with your child, go to either a community paediatrician or um, your health visitor. But you've really got to read up about it because you'll need to fight all the way. Because if you don't fight for your kids, nobody else will. Then I think, I think that Pushing you out, uh, pushing you out of your comfort zone. Um, like you going to uni was, I was like amazed because it's, it's, you know, to I think to any adult, it's quite scary to be in a new situation. I think that you could have probably enjoyed it more, but you know what, that's because like sometimes you think of uni and people like really socialising and really going out and and doing things because you're away from home. But you're not a party animal, so it, it's not, and I'm not necessarily saying that uni is, is about that. Um, I, I, I just feel like 
second time around that you've really come into your own. Well, you're still always to me be my little James. <laughs> Thank you very Sorry much. if that's insulting. <laughs> Would you say that it'd be an important factor to always have that two-way communication with the parents as well? I think the two-way interaction with parents is more essential than I can even begin to say. I think if that isn't there, then pupils are, at any stage in their education, are far more disadvantaged. That is essential because it means that strategies are put into place and the way the way we talk, the way we deliver things is, is a two-way traffic and you will find the same strategies being used at home. Plus the fact it's not an easy dimension to have to deal with from the parent point of view. And I think knowing that they got support from us and we were working as a team was reassuring and gave them confidence. Therefore, the confidence feeds out into you as well. What advice would you give to managers with employees who may have be like similar to your position, line manager, someone with autism or Asperger's syndrome? Well, I think all managers should be to have at least some level of awareness of, of Asperger's and autism and, and just to be able to have honest conversations with, with their staff to make sure that their needs are being met and that they're happy with the environment that they're, they're, they're in and the, you know, the work that they're being given and, and just to understand that, you know, everybody works differently, um, whether you, you have Asperger's or autism or, or, or not. You know, everyone has their own way of working and their own way that they like to be treated, I think. And I think it's it's just important to recognise that people are all different and you need to, you know, you need to deal with people as, as you find them and, and, and to try and make sure that you speak to them and have honest conversations with them so that you can understand what they need you to be doing as a manager in the same way that, you know, that they need to understand what, what the manager wants them to do as a member of staff. Don't be afraid to be yourself. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, don't be afraid to seek out a community that accepts you and loves you for who you are, like as cheesy as that sounds. Um, but it's something really simple that you just don't really think about, um, especially if you're like newly diagnosed, you're kind of, um, I'd say you kind of go through like the five stages of grief in a way, like when you get diagnosed with something new in general. Um, because I've, I've seen a lot of people like in absolute denial about it, like they don't want to accept it, they don't want to even like think about it, and it's not a bad thing. It's really not like, <laughs> so many autistic people have like, you know, succeeded um, and just gone on to do amazing things. Um, and it's really, really not a bad thing at all. Um, but just don't be afraid to seek out help. Don't be afraid to think, you know, you are disabled enough, you do deserve help and you do deserve you know, a loving community that supports you no matter what. And remember, no matter if you've got a disability, don't let it stop you from achieving your hopes and dreams and go beyond your disability.